I just think the overseas people think you. Oh is yeah, who, who is this? We know who it is. We know it's Tony uh, Zaleski. I think it was just to be <laughs> casual. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it can be casual. reason because I don't want to become nervous myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So, so yeah, I think we'll have a few positions where you know, I, I really want to collaborate on, you know, trying to work them out with you. Of course, I, I've analysed them at home, but um, you know, I think it's a good thing for sort of practicing our, our thought processes, but. Um, by the way, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have that, that's just hearing you. My hearing is very good. That, that, that's great. So yeah, just raise your hands if you have the point you'd like to make, and if I've said something silly, and um, I will try to explain a bit further. So you know, I called this lecture you know, "Fortresses to Storm the Keep or to Withstand a Siege," and I just find that there are some end game positions which are truly amazing because. One side has a clear superiority, and you know, they may have extra material up to you know, a queen versus a rook, or something like that. But they can't win, because of some, you know, some quite unusual situation, which a lot of people don't expect. So, first of all, I think we need to figure out what a fortress is. Um, I mean, everyone has a vague idea about it, but I think that um, there are a few things here. So, if you have a position, I think the, the defense is quite active. So let's say we're going to be um, playing something like this. I mean, okay, so we can pick a queen if they're this is new. But the point is that, okay, you can play queen g3, check here. And black can actually defend this by moving into the corner. And then if we take the pawn, it's a stalemate. But um, I, I think the defensive idea is to promote and, and to equalize the material. So I don't consider that to be a fortress. <coughs> um, it's more to do with setting up an impregnable position or you know, tying down your opponent's pieces. And it's a form of passive defense, basically. So. Okay, there are a lot of different types of fortresses, and I'll start with one I, I really like, um, which involves the sending of bishop and knight versus queen. So, normally if you just put the pieces randomly on the board, uh, bishop and knight can't draw against the queen. But, this one fortress which exists, where you basically, if you manage to set up this position, Keeping Black's King out of your 
position. And this one involving the idea of two knights versus. I'm going to have to find another knight. Okay, so two knights versus a queen, which is usually drawn as long as you keep the knights next to each other. So, with. Um, you basically have the knights side by side. And it's a really good sort of defensive setup because the, the king finds it extremely difficult to approach. And if it tries to go around to the side, the knights can regroup. So, the, 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 for a very long time, they used to think you could the knights so that they defend each other. But uh, that just means that they're doubling up and not able to control as many squares. But there's a way of trapping Black's king in the corner. So, let's say you put the king here. Uh, can anyone suggest where I could put these knights so that the black king is kind of yeah, okay. in jail? Go. F6 and H5? Yeah, F6 and H5, F6 and E8. Uh, and this is quite a funny thing. So, the king can't go to any of these squares while the knights defend each other. And as long as the king can stay near the knights, then there's nothing black can do to win. But I set up this position on chess space and turned the computer on. Now, there are pretty much two ways of using the computer, I think, to analyze an endgame position like this. You can turn on the table base and get a complete run through of how many moves it takes to win or whether it's a draw. Or you can turn Houdini on. And I did both of them. The table base told me that black wins in 22 moves. Houdini thought it was a draw. And uh, could not, even after 10 or 15 minutes, I think I left it on. It just couldn't find the win. So, it seems really tricky. These knights, you can't do anything about them. The first move that Dean was suggesting is to take the knight, which is obviously uh, you know, not a very possible way to play because you just end up in a drawn position right away. So, what's an idea that Black has to try to break up the fortress? I've got one that maybe somebody else can yeah. go. By checking the king, the white king, so moving the black king so that the white king can't come close. Well, so we could give a check, but the king probably will move in this direction because Sorry, that's it's all right. I mean, I, um, the point is that uh, as long as the king just keeps moving around, um, nothing will change. You want to put the king in kind of zigzag, I guess, like put, push the king in the corner so one of the knights has to move. That's precisely the idea. So that's why the king wants to stay closer to the knights. Uh, and this is the idea the computer couldn't see because it's, a, it's like a long-term plan and uh, found, it, found it obviously very difficult to calculate to that position and to evaluate everything since there's like an explosion in how many moves can be played at each point and there's how many variations we'd have to consider. So we can't just think, I want to stalemate the game. So what's going to happen is that we'll try to get a position like this with white to move. And one of the knights will have to move. So we'll say this one. And then we can win one of the knights. So what would your basic idea of mark it? Queen D1 check. Yeah, Queen D1 check, Queen A4 check, various things. So it, it's actually kind of fun to force the king into the corner in this position. Um, I find it pretty interesting. So what's the first move, Tristan? Queen D4. Yeah. Uh, 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 can I make a comment? I remember a talk given by Michael Guzman yep. to some juniors who are beginners. He's teaching them king and queen against king. Yep. So you do a knight attack with the queen. The queen. Yeah, that's right. So it's a knight attack. This idea comes up a lot in various queen endings, not just uh, king and queen versus king and, um, and this one. I think we're going to return to it later on, but for now. Uh, Okay, I think that they don't want to cooperate. They probably don't want to go towards the corner, so we'll put it here. It looks like it's going further away, actually. You do another knight attack. Yeah, so uh, it's queen c5. And the king goes this way. I mean, yeah, you, you just play the move, which is a knight attack. You can do another attack. Yeah, king c2, queen c4, king a4, and then queen b6. Hmm. Okay, 
So after it was pretty inevitable, really. It was, it was, if the king is further away, the knights can interfere like, further away from the corner. But now we have the situation that then one of the knights has to move, and then like the this And um, yeah, I actually found this in a very old book. It was uh, Staunton's Handbook, I think, on um, the chess player's handbook. So the, um, it was really interesting to me that a book published around about 1850 contained a position that a computer couldn't solve. And it's a really nice example of uh, just a computer failing to see an idea, and you can't work it out by calculation because the queen had too many moves. It couldn't distinguish between this one or that one. So um, my life's up. Oh. Another position which has been analysed for a very long time, or people have known about for a long time, would be this one. And we're getting to another barrier position. So we'll look at a few other kinds of fortresses, but let's start off with this one, which is the one I thought of first. Fortresses. So this ending is actually kind of difficult. The winning method is extremely long, but it's important once you get too bogged down with details here, I think. So rather than starting to calculate various things, you need to stop and just think of what you're trying to achieve. And the most basic thing you're trying to do is to take this pawn. So that would result in king and queen versus king and rook, and that's a theoretical win. Um, though, in fact, there was a game between Yakovenko and Morozovich just a few years ago, where Yakovenko managed to draw this against Mozovich with the rook. So it's not easy to win. So somebody else got a draw? Um, Ian Rogers got a draw against a 2300 player. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's actually worth uh, taking a moment to read an endgame book about this because. The, the, it's more like the other guy failed to win. He should have won. Yeah, well, it's true that uh, if you know your technique, you'll probably win with your team. But it's not as easy as all that. It makes no difference whether he say he managed to draw the other guy. Okay, I think we're better, you know, uh, this is going to take a while to explain. It. So, um, so, first off, we want to win this round. And the problem is that we have a rock in the way which is covering the entire fifth rank, as well as the E file. So it's like it's a cage, like he did. And the way to break down a barrier is usually through Zugsmon. So, um, the way that it's done is to move the queen, the queen behind the pawn and try to force the king out to d5 or to the fifth rank, and that will interfere with the rook. What black would want to do, uh, if they can, is to keep the rook here, or maybe to switch between these two positions. But uh, we can basically place the Winters Rooks one. And it's a little bit tricky, but it involves moving the queen around the world. And eventually you'll get the position where you can play queen c6. Probably all require losing a move, but let's say you have another move. The king needs to defend. You play queen c7. Check and pawns attack, so we force the king to drop here. And we get the queen behind. So now the idea is that we're going to play queen e8 check d7 so that the king is out on the fifth rank. And then, uh, what is, I'll just set that up. With black to move here, they basically need to let you cross the fifth rank. Um, I, I mean, this is king c5, eventually we do ensure that it gets into six one, so something like this. Uh, the king can't make another the rooks can have to move. You know, of course there's a lot more to it, but uh, this is the gist of it. And uh, then once we do manage to get across, so supposing they just accept this is happening, White will use a further six one to cross the E file and get behind the pawn. And at that point, um, once you have the king behind the pawn, it's pretty easy, in fact, to, um, to think about it during the game because you've probably uh, added a lot of time to your clock by that point. So, 
as long as you have some familiarity with the facts that you can win this sort of position, right, then you have pretty good practical chances to actually win it. And you need to know that this idea of forcing the key out. To be honest, I once had a position like this, and I did believe that it was a draw, but it wasn't. So I think I accepted a draw. It was, um, it was within that form. like to play and they need to try to win. But the problem is that if we try to just bring our king forwards, they're going to be in stalemate. So Black's idea is that they're going to keep shuffling the king between g7 and h8 and draw this. So can anyone suggest a way that we might actually try to win? Uh, yeah. Okay. Triangulate the king uh, in order to um, wait, in order to um, Actually, it's a white to move when the king is on g7, then play h8, check, sacrifice the pawn, then play king h6, force black to play king g8, then play g7. Yeah. So, just basically triangulate the king so it's a white to move when the king is on g7. So, um, if, yeah, if you're right, 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 um, why not play king f6? Mm. Is that more yeah, This is like if you were playing a blitz game on ICC, it's going to be... Um, and I was about to lose in the chain. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't matter, you can do either if you will win. The king f6 is better, yeah. Yeah, so sometimes you can break down these stalemate fortresses just by sacrificing some material. But what would happen if I replace the pawn with the bishop? It's a draw. Yeah, it's a draw. The bishop can't promote. And you know, th there's no threat which is actually going to be, um, to be big enough here. The bishop has just got stuck. Uh, does everyone agree with this? Or? Yeah. Okay, so, this is another really interesting thought, because it can happen sometimes, but it would be quite rare. Um, now, earlier today I invented a position. It's another fortress involving a bishop. Okay, so the idea is to put So 
so it's back to you. And there's a way they can draw this, despite being down so much material. Showing somebody earlier today this, uh, uh, yeah, this idea that for a moment I thought I was um, I'd set up wrong and you're going to have the right bishop. But this is ending where you may have face off the board. And this is a draw. It's the same sort of idea as before with the pawn and the bishop, where the king's just going to be in the corner, move out on the top. So we can put the pawn here, the king here. And there's nothing that White can do about this. The king's just going to come out there, back. If you try to stop it, then you put it in stalemate. So I tried to think of a kind of unusual introduction to this because um, I thought it was better than just showing the position everybody knew. So, yeah, this is 1906 check. Oh, okay. Thanks, Ian. Um, and now, if you take it, you know, it doesn't matter which piece you take it with. So, the pawn, the bishop, this is going to be stalemate. Um, so, the king's going to have to move. Yeah, so it's defending the bishop. I'm going to take this. The king takes this. So, the king in the corner, and it's drawn. This is a, a fortress with the wrong bishop. So, um, now I'll show you. So this fortress of the pawn of Henry and Bishop, this is not a incarcerated piece like the one that knights were blocking the king from getting out. And I show you with the pawn there, but um, mainly I just introduced this fortress. And then I show you the fact that this is also a fortress. So there's a position which I found um, in a really good book, which is also another quite old book. It's called in, um, Lasker's Chess Manual. It has a lot of these kinds of positions. Oh, I've got that. Yeah, it's a great book. It's very interesting. Yeah, it is. It was written by Emmanuel Lasker, of course. So, shift to the other side of the board, so you know, we still have the wrong color. Mm -hmm. You showed this position to me during coaching, did you? Was it this position? Um, yes, it was this position. But, so, Marky, you know all about it, but you'll have to let everyone else try to work it out. <laughs> Okay, so um, why isn't this an easy win for White? They're a bishop up and they have this pawn. Because if Black moves the B pawn, if White takes to the pawn, you've got the fortress you mentioned before. Yeah, that's it. Takes to the bishop, it's a good corner of the wrong ballot. Yeah, the king can get to the corner, so it will be a draw. And that's uh, the problem. So you need to keep the king out of the corner in this type of position. And there's a very naive way of approaching this position where white plays king c5. So king e6, maybe king c6 should be played. On the other hand, what if this happens? Yeah, this is forced. If the king gets too far from the pawn, I think we might have a problem. So b5. Yeah, that wins a tempo, doesn't it? Because you've got to play yeah. king d5. So it's this thing where, you know, you, you need to see that you have two different ideas. Mm. It's also b6 and b5. Yeah, it looks that way. So one moves up. You keep pushing. This bishop yes, will have yeah. to run back and stop them. And then once that happens, the king gets to the corner and it's a draw. So... It looks like black has a way of reacting 
to this attempt to break down the fortress. Sometimes you need to abandon your fortress in a way to try to draw. So I guess that might be an example of this. Um, and sometimes you, you need to avoid abandoning your fortress. And I've, I once lost the game because I panicked um, with the fortress. So I thought I, I needed to do something that I actually didn't. So can you play king d4, king c3, king b4, king b5 and then come up? This is the kind of idea. Well, all we really want is this position with black to move and we'll just win. And we need to achieve that somehow. I find it hard to believe that we can't maneuver around to get that to happen. So, okay, we can't go this way because the set of B5 is too serious. So we can't go to C4 because we check C5, so we have to go here, I think. Right. So, the most natural move for black to play, I think, might be to move out to C6. And maybe we keep going to Paul's side here, so we can play C3. But then King, um, King... B5, is that a problem? Oh, Bishop B6? It's a little on A6. Yeah, it's a bit. So Bishop B6. And um, so we might try hiding the king on A6. Okay. This won't work because the king will just go around to C7. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, because King D4. And eventually we'll, yeah. we'll win this form. So. King c4, king c6, king c3, king b5 is important. I guess they're just going to... And is the bishop on um, bishop still a7? Right a7, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what else is black going to do? I guess they can just stop, um, hang around here passively and see what happens. But it looks to me like white's going to move with the king forwards and eventually win the pawn like that was from kings on b6 and c8. So... Well, we know that b5, a6 is a win, the king just goes to b4. Um, so the pawn should move. What about um, b6? Yeah, b6. So we started from this question king d4, king 6 king c3. Okay, just making sure. You know, I wanted this to be the position you want to so I haven't organized everything about it. So if b6 here, oh, that's trouble. King, B6, B5. king b5, yeah. Okay. Looks like we can't do that. So what can we do? Hmm. Looks like the b pawn moving is a problem. Can we just lose the move? Yeah, because the king had to call. Yeah, so the king sort of moved out a bit, and we have time for this because it has so many moves to get to the pawn. Um, so this is very natural. And we stopped the b pawn from moving. In fact, I'll probably king b7. Black wants a threat where they can go to the corner and maybe try to force the bishop back so they get the pawn moves back. And what could white play now? No, um, I think the king's going to go to. No, king oh no, but then we, we flush it out again. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, king d5. Um, so we had. King d5. Well, I reckon it's king d5. We could just transpose the original position. The king c5. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, they're going to play king, but if, if king c8, bishop a7, king c7, king b5. That would win. Um, so. And if b6 check. We'll take it to Yeah, it's not the same as before because the king can take it. And that way we will actually push the pawn forward. So. There's not much else they can do. Okay, so I, I think that we've worked it out now. Um, we 
you start off with King B4, and when they play this, we may as well the bishop on B6, King B7. These are all very natural moves, so I feel like the horse position is to happen. Could you play B5 here? Um, I think A6 would be sustained. Oh, yeah, A6. In the King's move, yes. Yeah, so, um, So this is the winning method that Lasky gave, that may have happened in the game. It was the game with a Lewis Paulson and another player called Metco uh, that, that was analyzed. It would be interesting to see this happen in the game. It's another position. I think the computer would do much better with this one than with the Knights trapping the King. Because Can I just ask, sorry Chris, after Black plays King D8, how does White win? Is it black's move in this position? Yes. Yeah, so King D8. Well, we might have something more to do then. Yeah, you can, yeah that's right. You can yeah. control that. And, and that's going to take away the king's ability yeah, to right. back so, to H2 or something. Yeah. Um, but the king's on B6. Yeah. And even if B, um, B6 king takes, this is still the king. Mm. Or A6. Yeah, the interesting cool, cool, thing yeah. about it, we may have to lose the move of the bishop. So, perhaps. And then once the king moves, we take the pawn. So, it's again, it's this one breaking down the board. It's very often the way that we do it. Okay, now, there's another kind of fortress, which is a kind of uh, a bind. So, the way this works is that your opponents, well, the player who is trying to win uh, is having a lot of trouble moving their pieces into active or into better positions. And there's this game I saw, which was from the New York tournament in 1924, between, uh, it was between Edward Lasker and Emmanuel Lasker, and a bind fortress happened in this one. And the, the sensational thing about the game was that uh, Emmanuel Lasker was uh, I think he won that tournament despite having lost the title of the world champion few years before it. Uh, and he was having a lot of trouble in this game, beating his namesake. So, let me just make sure I get this absolutely right. And actually, more than that, he was in a losing position. So, we had a few moves before. Like to play here. There was a very complicated exchange down ending leading into this position. And uh, Edward Lasker wrote about it in one of his books. So there was apparently a group of players watching the game. And you know, according to Edward Lasker, they were making they, they were talking about it amongst each other and they, they all wanted Emmanuel Lasker to lose because then they'd have a chance to win the tournament, of course. So earlier on there was a moment where it looks like, like, uh, like Edward Lasker lost um, Managed to play a winning move, and he actually overheard uh, Alekhein talking in German to the other players and saying, "No, this may be a very subtle move." But um, according to Edward Blasky, he then got out subtled by his opponent. So we reached this position, and he thought he would win now. So the reason is that he thought his opponent would need to play and then Blasky would need to play king three. Black would then play king four. And white would need to win the pawn because you don't usually draw an ending rook in the pawn for a knight down. So, check, takes. And the unfortunate thing is that although king and knight versus king and rook is a pretty easy draw, um, with some exceptions. No, no, king and rook versus king is the win. Yeah, well, the knight makes a big difference. You know, I think it was Ruben Fine who said in his endgame book, you need a rook's advantage to win uh, in a pawnless endgame, but it's not actually true. With table actually, there's somewhere you usually need a four pawn advantage, an advantage with four pawns according to the pawn count. There would be too many. But there's an exception of 
Queen versus uh, Bishop and Knight. Sometimes Queen versus Ag versus uh, no, no, there are so and four knight, four mana pieces versus the Queen. Okay, four Martin, Martin, pieces. Um, there are so many exceptions that you can see all of them. Uh, yes. Even Rook and Bishop versus two He's knights can be one. I heard there's some way four uh, mana okay, pieces. Okay, Martin, we need to keep going. Four um, mana pieces versus the Queen is a win for the mana pieces. Is that true? Um, I think it is. But check those table pieces. Yeah, but that's an interesting ending. But we need to keep going. Right. So. Now, um, that would be a win for black pieces. <laughs> um, so, with this ending, um, so they were going to play king a3 and win the pawn, well, that's what he thought, but they did something else. Last king did something else. And what was that? Knight c3, threatening a fork on e, whatever it is, e2? Maybe? Um, so, oh, yeah, we'll push pawn. We can push the pawn. Mm. So, the threat isn't severe enough for Black to be able to go Can we now just take the knight? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh, we, we would like to try to bring the pawn, but it doesn't look like we can. Two. Yeah, that's yeah. it. So knight b2 got played, and then uh, black suddenly realizes, uh, how am I going to win this? The king can't cross in front of the rook, because then we do get the ending with king knight versus rook, and that's just a draw. Uh, we can sort of approach along here, and this will be interesting, because they, I guess what they're trying to do reach this position. Just keep uh, shuffling the knight between b2 and a4 forever unless the king crosses the third rank. That's it. So you need to just continue with the same way of drawing. And the king won't get really close to giving you any trouble. What about if the king moves behind the rook and on the second rank? That's the idea that you might have. So, uh, okay, three, so. then rook c3. I think. No, e3. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the fourth. I've seen that three, yeah. Yeah, E3. So, uh, yeah, so this is a bit quicker than you know, going all the way around there. We just bring the room to us. Um, I think that we have got the fourth anyway. Yeah, so, okay. Some winning method like this was attempted. So, okay. <coughs> B2. Not J3, the room. Sometimes I think when they try to win your, um, to break through the fortress like this, we probably do need to make, play something active. So we saw that with the b5 idea when White was trying to insert all the king before. And it seems like it's too much of a luxury for the king to go to g3 when the pawn is so vulnerable over here. So after rook f3, I think maybe White should. White can play king. To move the king, yeah. and, and the thing is, now if the king moves to g3 to get around, uh, can this, I know Bill has seen this, like, can anyone else suggest what white's going to do? Knight c5. c5. Yeah, knight c5. And, and then you just win the ball. So, it's a draw again. Because the king is all fit, it can't help with this. Black in the line where the king and the rook just won that knight. There's another, with these bishop endings as well, um, sometimes you get a fortress where you're controlling
controlling some critical squares. I just have the, these squares be used by the group. So there are some really interesting situations with a bishop and pawn versus a bishop. controlling all the squares that matter. And these are the ones all these uh, But of course, even if you had uh, a more favorable position for the bishop, this won't necessarily result in a win. So because you need to drive the bishop off the diagonal somehow. But it can't be done here. So you could try you can try some trick that is very transparent because they just aren't going to take you. Can um, you try bishop f8? Yeah, this is the way you, you really want to try to win. Uh, to try to put the bishop here, force it off, and then promote the pawn. But they just keep moving the bishop. And there's not much you can do about this. Uh, so, we're, we're more accurate to say there's nothing you can do about it rather than not much. Yeah, I, I think that's true. It would be quite unlikely if you're to make a mistake here, but it's maintaining the fortress, and there'll be about six moves that they can do to uh, manage that. But of course, you can have positions in this game that are winning as well. So, um, with the g6 form, uh, so what do you think the first move is going to be here for like? G7. Yeah, we want to drive the bishop off the diagonal, and then somehow we remove the pawn forward, and they can't do anything about it going even further. So the bishop here uh, doesn't matter too much. I guess they'll get there, so they can get to a square that's not controlled by the king. And then, how could I keep on going and trying to win this? Bishop d4? Yeah, so we, we just make room for the pawn. It's sort of important where we put the bishop. Uh, it wouldn't be that great to put it here. After bishop d4, their only move to stop the pawn moving forward is to place it there. Yeah, and then you got bishop b3. That's not as easy as it looks, actually. Black still has a move. Yeah, uh, bishop b3. Yeah. So if the king takes, king takes the pawn, and so the bishop can just stay there. Okay, is that what is that play? Yeah, the black is not going to be able to hold on to this. Yeah. yeah. So we, we might as well just move the bishop and, and see what the, the idea is. And so if the king moves now, we just take the bishop because it's no longer tying us to the pawn. Okay. And the other thing that can happen is if uh, they move the bishop, we'll take it. So, uh, there's not too much more to be said about that kind of a situation. And there's this, uh, so the point of this is that the diagonal, the shorter of the two diagonals of the bishop, so uh, this is a longer, a longer diagonal, and it can just stay along here until we force it off. But if the shorter diagonal crossing the forward uh, is not long enough. So in this case, if it's only three squares, then the position can't be one. But if it's a bit longer, you can actually succeed in drawing this sort of situation. So, right, let's say we put a point here. Let's say the What's a move that will do that? Bishop d3? Yeah, any move along this diagonal. Otherwise, you get it to here, and it's just going to be able to control that. So, to g3. And now, what's black's only defense? Yeah, 
So they need to come to that long diagonal, uh, sorry, the shorter diagonal. And in this case, it doesn't look like we can actually do anything about this. So I mean, you can control that square, and then the problem is it will go here. And this is this going to um, continue to move along this diagonal? There's not like, very much we can do about this. So, yeah, this kind of position really depends on how far the point advanced the point is, and, and if it's far enough, then you find that the diagonal uh, is only three squares or less, and that will allow you to put these two on. Okay, so. Because I, I sort of said, well, maybe we don't have time to the detail, but it looks like we do. So, how can we start out trying to win this? And, and the idea was to go behind the queen and to try to flush it out so that it interferes with the rook, and then we put them into zooks on the cross. Well, hit, uh, like queen, yeah. hit the queen to c8. Yeah, that's, queen a6. that would be a good idea. So, um, queen a6. We can start with that. Um, maybe I'll just move. Queen d6, well, something else can go there. Yes. Um, queen uh, b7. Yeah, and then, maybe this wasn't the best defensive try because it looks like we're going to just be forced back very easily with these knight moves. So, could you play rock c5? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, in d6, maybe we should try rock c5. interesting because they're also abandoning that. Okay, so it looks like the flight has managed to stop our invasion, but I'm sure we can find some other way in. So let's just keep going and we, we know we want to get the queen behind. So Why can't you just shuffle the rook? So king, uh, rook e5, rook c5, rook e5, rook c5, what happens? Well, if you uh, if you leave this square, the queen can move on to that square. Oh, and check, yeah. So it will attack yeah, the board. Yeah. And the problem is, if your king is here, then we'll start to force it out. Mm. So it's not as easy as it looks. This is why I agree to draw in a position like this without knowing, uh, because it looks so obvious when it isn't. It was a game with Jamal. Yeah, um, that's right. Were you, uh, you against? Were you against Morris or something? Uh, that was against Gene Nakauchi and. A guy at West came up to me after the game and asked me whether it was one of the drawn positions. And I didn't know what he was talking about because... Uh, I thought it was a winning position. The game in the it was a winning position. It was with the knight the bishop's point. Yeah. Yeah. And it was on the sixth rank. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah. I, I... After he said that, I suddenly really realized, <laughs> oh, this is actually something that we need to look into. So Queen B7, I don't think they want to go out here on this. And we're, we're basically trying to put black into the zone somehow, but it's not as easy as it might appear. Um, queen v8 check, we're just playing king d7, I guess. So it's interesting. I know that occasionally moving the king is a strategic thing that we can do. So you can end up with the zone one. Uh, if the rook moves to e5, what will white do? Queen c7. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that means, you know, this is like what Paul was saying before, the rook can't keep oscillating between those two squares because if it does, it loses control of c7. And then everything just collapses because yeah, it, it's, it's serious. So, so if you play rook to e5, queen c6, playing the rook, if rook e6, the king moves to f5. So neither of the defences are working very well at all. What about... Okay, so we might play King D8. We are still having some trouble with this. Okay, so how can we keep going? We can't attack so we can play queen f6, they play king d7. And then if 
we play the Phoenix and the King of Boys return. I want to use for you guys. Can we see A? I guess? I don't know. Maybe King of Four? Oh, what is it? Yeah. See the way you can make progress, isn't it? King of Four? But this time the spur is covered. Oh, I'm sure we'll get to the point of this. Queen, queen f6 check. Queen f8. Dead on the back. How do you win? How do you win from there? How do you win the pawn? Well, you force the king up here and then you get to cross the fifth right. rank and then okay. you bring your king up behind. Mm. So it's still very it difficult. It takes a long time. Mm. It does take a lot of patience and support. <laughs> this is a very challenging position actually. So I had second thoughts about actually um, covering this today, but I think it's, it, it's nice to give everyone a starting point thinking about these positions. Just make sure that I have actually um, covered everything. Don't stress, Chris. You've done an excellent job. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is everything I was planning to do. So, okay, well, let's just maybe sum up so that we don't leave it hanging in the dirt. So I, I start off with um, sort of defining what a fortress is. And that's... It's interesting because there are some positions which sort of you know almost seem like a fortress, but there's some more active defense. So I, so I find you know, I showed you a position of pawn and king versus king and queen, and I, I felt that wasn't a fortress. But there are other stalemating positions we saw which actually are. Um, then usually you've got to have some sort of a. It's a position where your opponent has a, a material advantage. So it might be queen for rook and pawn or Knight and Bishop, which is usually enough to win, but you know, the, the player with the fortress might construct a barrier, or they may be able to hide on, on the square and then come out and hide, and you, you can't get them out of there without stalemating them. Um, and there was also the situation where, you know, particularly in Bishop endings, where you might have to control certain critical squares and just stop your opponent getting there. So that was with that whole thing where we're controlling the diagonal. The way to break down a fortress very often was Sug Swan. Uh, actually in almost all of those positions, except occasionally, I, I guess, perhaps with the binding fortress, Black's winning attempt involved trying to advance the form to win the knight. So that's not always the case. And yeah, well, there was that kind of a binding fortress. I once had, a, had one of those when I was uh, playing in the World Cities Championships. That was what I was referring to when I said I once messed one up. Uh, I was playing this Miesis who came to Australia um, very recently for a tournament, and I, I managed to defend an exchange down position, get a fortress, and then I sort of panicked when he tried something very similar to what Glaska did, and then I just thought I had to play something active and it all uh, collapsed. And, um, so you, you need to remain calm at all times, I think. That's where you get to play on board one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, I did because I that, that was... Uh, it was very short notice, actually. Yeah. So I got to play Miesis, um, another 2700 Moisienko from Ukraine. And <laughs> that game, he, he won more convincingly than Miesis. But they're just really strong players because they're so consistent. Uh, 
with me as this, I thought I, I sort of had his number, but he played so consistently, even though he had a bad position, he didn't make any serious mistakes, and then eventually I blundered the exchange or something, so he was in time trouble. So, um, that's what I find amazing about those kind of monsters, actually. Um, so, yeah, well, with the Binding Fortress, I think that's another example. I'll just show you something similar. It happens in a very important game, in Kasparov, uh, Kramnik versus Kasparov. And the idea of a fortress is something like this. Inside something else, inside something else. So there's, there's also, a, I think, a short story that little kids read like that, uh, the, the woman who ate the fly or something. Or, and basically, the pawn is being defended by the knight, which is being defended by the rook. And you can't actually move any of them properly. So you can't move the rook away to defend the pawn because then the knight gets taken. Uh, you can't move the knight because then pawn gets taken, you can't move the pawn because then it gets taken. And it's just this situation where it seems that there's nothing you can do. It's a binding fortress here. So it's very similar to the one with uh, the Laskers, where the knight kept going back and forth. And, and the rook was having to defend this pawn. I think these situations with binding fortresses are very highly tactical. Uh, so I, I find it a bit sharper than the barriers, where you've sort of got a constant thing going on. To maneuver around. Rook G8. Uh, Rook G8. Rook G8. White smooth. Possibly I didn't set it off right, but. <laughs> okay, Rook G8. No, that, that looks good. I'll, I'll put the Rook here. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow this reminds me of a little joke I once played on. Because okay, we have this situation after King takes. Something about Richie reminded me of this little trick. And sort of onto me. Maybe I'm um, just tell you it is, um, it is quite amusing. Um, I have to think. So it's a situation where you have a rook in front of a pawn like this. We'll put the king away a little bit. Uh, and I think it was this game with Morphins where he played a winning move in this position. Well, what's the winning group? Rook H8. Yeah, or so G8. we all know about this. It's, um, rook G8 is also good, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so then if the rook takes the pawn, <coughs> then screw it and you win the rook. But there was a very funny position I decided to put in a puzzle set when I was coaching once. And that position involves the king being on H3. So, when I said this is a puzzle, everyone replied that they were going to win using the move Rook H8. <laughs> and what does Black do? Rook H1. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, it, I like this because we're trying to win by a skewer, but our opponent wins by a skewer. And they just so happen to be um, defending against A8. So, uh, and the reason that the king is being placed on e7 is so that the position wouldn't be impossible. Um, so what you're supposed to say is rook g8. And then black can engage in a bit more trickery and play with one. King g2. Yeah, you have to play king g2. And it just gets forward by the pawn promotion. So it's just to win. Okay, so are there any questions about anything that you did today or is, um, that you'd like to ask? Or?
What, what about fortresses not in pawn not against pawn king? Against king. Oh yeah, there are a lot of those. Um, so yeah, where, uh, no matter how much you maneuver the knight around the board, you can never waste a turn for Oh yeah, okay, that, that's a good one. I know what we're talking about here. So, we're, it's another incarceration fortress, so where you imprison the, his, the king here. And, yeah, I like showing this to people, which is so surprising. Okay, so, we'll put the king on the board, and after we do that, it's going to be white smooth. So, if I put the king on c7, can white win? No. So, knight might go to f7. What black's plan is, is just to keep oscillating the king between c8 and c7. You might want to take the look at Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would kind of spoil the pass you got. King C8, and this is going to go on forever. The funny thing about it, and it makes a lot of sense, so at first I didn't understand this when I saw this the first time, because can't the knight go off somewhere and you know, have an adventure, lose a move, come back? Uh, and it doesn't work that way, because uh, it's when you move the knight, it's mm. always going back to white. That's it. That's so okay. I only thought of that recently, actually. I, I just sort of took it for granted that we can't lose the move with the knight, but if you think about it, we're always moving from a white square to a dark square to a white square and so on. Black is doing the same thing. So when you return, um, you're going to move to a white square and the king's going to move to a white square. There's nothing you can do about it. And you know, if you had the board coloured in all in as white squares or all as dark <coughs> squares, you wouldn't be able to see that uh, so clearly, I guess. So that's. I guess that's why they call the board uh, in, in such a way. It helps you also with the bishops. <laughs> but let's say, uh, I think I put the knight here. Let's say the king started on c8, so it's on opposite color squares to the knight. Uh, what is white going to do to try to win this? He's going to win. Oh, I'll take it. Uh, knight d3. In, in the knight d3 is one move. With the idea of king c7, knight d4, king c8, knight d5. Yeah. So we just need to bring the knight to um, the square where it's controlling c7, and then no, it's six, six, six. the king can't maintain it. It's another zugzwang. I think it's a reciprocal zugzwang. Because if it were white's turn, oh no, it's not a reciprocal. Is it? No, it is because if it's white's turn and they move the knight away, uh, this is a draw. If it's black's turn, then they lose. So this is reciprocal zugzwang. Uh, yeah, and it's really interesting. You can have all these combinations. So if you have, but anyway, uh, this is just one of the fortresses I think Bill was um, mentioning. Yeah. There. And, and there are a few others with the knight. You can have also. I know I was summing up, but uh, got into some interesting things here. You can have positions. It looks like a fortress, but because if you approach with the king, then it'll be a draw. No, that is a way to move. Well, that's the question. So if it's, oh, I think you can always force it to be black smooth. Yeah. Um, or white smooth, because you just keep moving the king. But it, it's not actually a fortress. So I think that Marco uh, may have spotted why not. It depends whether it, whether it's winning. Uh, no, whether I can win, it depends on whether I'm slicing. So what was the reason they win? Yeah, knight c6. Yeah, this is knight c6, and we put black into oh, another six. Six one. They don't want to play anything, but they have to take the knight. Yeah, um, and then we run the black, black to move, move. I think white's also weak. Yeah, I don't yeah, think it's it still <laughs> with the So if it's black to move and they play king v8, um, we'll just play sorry, the knight v8. So king d8, king a8, knight c6 again. B takes king c7, it's another room. Um, but there are only the other positions where it is a fortress. Is it a fortress successful fortress? 
Is the white point on A7? Yeah. yeah. That's reminded me of something. And the, and the um, there's no black point. Yeah, yeah. It's the nicest thing in the point. Oh, with. There's no black point. No black point. And, 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 and um, oh, the black king's on B7. And the nicest thing in the point. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, Doesn't matter where the that's a very is. important one because. Uh, yeah, this way. Oh, I've seen this one too. The king, it's very similar to the one with um, the wrong bishop, except this time, normally you would be able to win this by controlling a8, but you can't, it's a binding fortress, so you can't move the knight away because then the pawn gets taken, and if you try to defend the pawn, then you stalemate them, so it, it's also a catch-22, which I think... I don't know what catch twenty two means. Can you please explain that? <laughs> it's, it's a um, good book. It's about eight hundred pages long. Well, yeah, End of movie. Must have been around this sort of thing. The gist of it. Well, let's also say it's a catch twenty two. It helps. means that it's it's something that's a bit like, ironic. You, you, it's self defeating. So you want to do something, but you can't for another reason, and you want to do the other thing, but you can't because you haven't. You know, in this situation. You want to play knight c7, but you can't because you haven't played king b6. If you did play king b6, you wouldn't be able to play knight c7. So you can't have it both ways, so that's sort of what it means. It's a very hard word. Since there's a game tomorrow, I'd better finish up here. I hope it was interesting for everyone. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks. Let's, let's give him a round of applause. Yeah.